Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday night, and here we are, Friends and Fiction. I'm Mary Alice Monroe. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harbell. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. And I am Patty Callahan Henry, and this is Friends and Fiction. Five New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome half of the writing duo of Chris, Victoria Christopher Murray and Marie Benedict, who co-wrote an astounding new historical fiction novel titled The Personal Librarian. Tonight, we'll be hearing about their research and inspiration. We'll talk to Victoria about co-writing and how they work together to bring a very real woman, Belle DaCosta Green, to life. Hmm. Tonight is a rare pre-recorded show because while you were watching this, we are in my hometown of Beaufort, North Carolina, doing a live Friends and Fiction event that all of you will be able to watch later. And of course, next week we will be here live again, as always. But are you ready for tonight? Well, we are always want to start our show with a huge thank you to our partner, Mama G's. They have been with us now for months and our traveling companion on all our book tours, our <laughs> goodie bag swag, and of course, our cupboards are stocked. That's right, and I've stocked your houses in Beaufort with them too, oh, so you'll be ready to go. <laughs> well, right at home. And you can get their delicious cheese straws and cookies for 20% off with the code FAB5. It's a woman-owned business we all support. And because we love to surprise you at every turn, or at least at every <laughs> Every other turn, let's say. Mm -hmm. We have a great one night. Back in March, Patty gave us an exclusive cover reveal for her new novel, Once Upon a World, Once Upon blitter, a blitter, 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 blitter. coming out October 19th. And now she has a surprise for us, a pre-order gift that, well, I'm just going to let Patty tell you about it. <laughs> so, Once Upon a Time... <laughs> when I was a young girl in college, I met a friend named Karen Crawford. Now, all these years later, she is an astounding artist. I will put a link to her art at, in our Facebook page. But I asked her to paint a rendering using a combination of Narnia, which is the cornerstone of my October book, and the cover of Once Upon a Wardrobe. I wanted to see what she would come up with. I didn't tell her what to do. And what she came up with is so stunning. So Alan, put it up. This is Meg's. Oh, the so Meg is beautiful. Lost in the woods. Oh. Yes. Yeah. And I can't wait for you to meet Meg's in the novel. But this is a rendering that shows so much of what the book is about. And when I saw the painting, I knew I wanted to share it with all of you. So we have made some gorgeous note cards with a quote from the book. And the quote is, each and every one of us is born with our own stories and we must, must decide how to tell them. I love that. Yeah. So for every pre-order, you will get two of these postcards, one to keep and one to give someone you love. 
They are large postcards and they will come with a signed book plate and the original art on the postcard. Mm. So all of this will be on my website, my Facebook, the Instagram, and of course, Friends in Fiction, where you'll find an entry form. But I wanted to tell you all about it before I put it out into the world. Okay. Oh my gosh. I'm Beautiful. so excited for everybody to get to read that book. I was actually Me just too. on a podcast earlier tonight recommending it and saying how much oh, I loved oh. it. So I'm so thrilled. And what a beautiful painting. So you, you all out there know that every week here at Friends and Fiction, we partner with Parade Magazine Online. Mm -hmm. Not only do we stream live to their Facebook page, but we also write a life lessons essay for them, which you can always find at parade.com. And we always share it in our newsletter too. So this week, Week, Patty wrote about how our creative lives can be used as a compass. So for a long time, I kept a list of these. I need to dig it up, but I call them my as in life lessons. It's about things I learn in life from writing. For example, mm -hmm. I have so many of them, but one of my favorites is when I first learned that, as we all know, we have to know what our characters want, right? The more vague the want, the more vague the story, mm -hmm. as in life. Yeah. So, right, right? Like when yeah. you flip that around and you say, wait, what do I want? Am I having, mm. is my life aimless and, and can I look at what I really want? So I want to hear from you, ladies. Is there mm. anything your creative work has mm. taught you that you have used in your so-called real life? <laughs> my so-called life. Well, I'll answer. I think for me, I've been writing for a long time and all my creative work is pretty much based on intuition. Mm -hmm. And I've learned over the long years to trust it completely. So for example, when I choose a species to work with for a book, it's always a it is a lot I want to work with, but when I choose it, it's this humming, a strong sense of okay, yes, it's this one. I want to write about this one now. Timing is always important. And so then as I as I create the plot and the storyline and, and develop characters, it's that sixth sense as you're pulling it all together that you think, hmm, you know, this is some place I want to dig a little deeper. And I'm sure you all know what I mean. It's like, yeah. okay, this is the lead that I'm going to follow. And so in my life, I've just learned to trust that instinct too. And listening yeah. to myself, that inner voice is so yeah. important. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, for me, my fictional characters, I don't want them to be cardboard. I want them to be three-dimensional yeah. and totally human and flawed, screwed up people like me. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. us. <laughs> so when I write them, I allow them to make terrible errors in judgment, to make big and little mistakes. And I let them do things that terrify them and me. I, lots of times when they do something yeah. terrifying, you have to get out of your own yeah. way. You have to roll the dice and gamble on yourself. Yeah, you I know, that. I, I love that. And I think love kind that. of very along very similar lines. Um, you know, I, I tend to write about ordinary women who find themselves in these tough times and they dig deep for the strength to do extraordinary things. So it took me a long time to realize I was writing journeys that weren't just journeys on the page. They were journeys that I could take too. So nice. my lesson that I've drawn from my work, I think, is that we can all be extraordinary, um, even kind of in the small ways. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be leading a resistance movement during World War II. You can do small, extraordinary things um, because it's the small things that add up to the big changes in the world. And you just have to right. kind of, as, as Mary Kay said, you have to have the courage to, to roll the dice and find your way there. Mm, I love that. That's so great. Um, well, I agree with everything that you guys said, but I really love writing characters who find themselves in situations to which there's no right answer. Like yeah. when your back's against that wall, oh, yeah. these are your choices, but none of them are the right one or the mm -hmm. wrong one. There's like gray area. And so I love writing about women whose biggest challenges turn into their great teachers and put them on the path where they were meant to be all along. And right. I think we can all look back at points in our lives when something happened and we thought the world was ending and it ended yeah. up being the thing that you know was the next right step on our path so i think right right fun. yeah it's astounding that for a long time i thought and y'all probably did too that 
our work was over here and our yeah. life was over here. Yeah. And when you let the two of them kind of meld together and learn from your characters or your work or what your work is teaching you, it's it's mm -hmm. astounding. So yeah, I can't wait to hear what Victoria has to say about it um, mm -hmm. and what this book, The Personal Librarian, has taught or showed her about her life. Mm -hmm. So now let's talk about our incredible guests. We're so sad to tell you that Marie Benedict has been caught in unavoidable travel snarls. Oh, but we, I know, but we are sending her our love and our hope that she gets <laughs> home safely. Yeah. But we are so excited that Victoria is here with us. And we still want to tell you a little bit about Marie because she did co-author this book. Mm -hmm. And I get to tell you about her. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. But Marie <laughs> and you know, um, Patty and Mary Alice and I had dinner with Marie uh, a couple years ago at the Savannah Book Festival. And we had such a fun dinner that night. Uh, we had, it was a night of stars, right? We had Elizabeth. It Burke was, night it was. Right. So, um, you know, she told us about this book at dinner and said, yeah. I'm not allowed to tell oh, you who I'm writing. Are you with. serious? Patty, yeah. I forgot that. That's oh right. Oh my gosh. It all comes yeah. full circle. I yeah. love wow. it. Yeah. So Marie is a New York times bestselling author and a lawyer with more than 10 years experience as a litigator at two of the country's premier law firms. She found her calling unearthing the hidden historical law stories of women. She embarked on a new thematically connected series of historical novels with the other Einstein, which tells the tale of Albert Einstein's first wife. What followed were four more bestsellers about very real and very different, but very fascinating women. Now her first co-written book, The Personal Librarian, is out with the talented Victoria Christopher Murray. Writing as Heather Terrell, Mary has, Marie has also published the historical novels The Chrysalis, The Map Thief, and Bridget of Kildare. She so now lives we in. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, Kristen. She lives somewhere. No, I will tell you, she lives in Pennsylvania. She, she lives, lives in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. She does. She lives in Pittsburgh. She lives it. Yes, she lives right near. Oh my gosh, there's a great bookstore she lives near. Penguin, oh, I think oh. it's called the Penguin Bookshop in Sewickley. How do you yep. know this? That's a crazy. Because yeah. <laughs> she and I have talked about. It. I've been there. I've done a signing there. I'm like, okay. how do we not meet up? All right. I would love to tell you a little bit about her co-author, Victoria Christopher Murray, who's a native of Queens. She earned a BA in communication disorders from Hampton University and an MBA from New York University. Victoria spent 10 years in corporate America before launching an entrepreneurial company where she managed managed the number one division in finance for nine wow. consecutive years. That's amazing. Wow. And yet, despite the finance, she was once dubbed a Christian fiction writer because no one else was writing about religious topics. And Victoria trailblazed the literary scene, penning more than 30 novels, co-writing with other authors, and ghostwriting for top talent across the country. Wow. And Victoria now lives not in Pennsylvania, but in <laughs> Washington, D.C. Not near the Penguin Bookshop. So <laughs> <Yes>. the, per <laughs> the personal librarian is co-written by these women and is the remarkable story of J.P. Morgan's personal librarian, Belle DaCosta Green, the Black American woman who was forced to hide her true identity and passes white to leave a lasting legacy that enriched our nation. So now let's meet Victoria. Hi, Victoria, we are so happy Hello. to see you. Hi, you yes. see, I've been enjoying the show so much. I <laughs> up a little bit here. <laughs> we are so happy you're here and we have so much to talk to you about. So Christy, why don't you start us off? Yes, okay, so um, Victoria, I believe I've heard that this story started with Marie and she contacted you about this idea. So I'm just wondering, what did you think when she called you? Did you know about Belle? So this is a funny story. Um, actually, Marie contacted, she read one of my novels and then she contacted her agent who contacted my agent. Okay. And so Marie sent a two page double, I mean, a single space proposal. Mm -hmm. 
And um, when my agent said, I want you to really kind of take a look at this and see if um, you'd be interested in it. Um, the first thing I did was look up Marie Benedict. And yeah. so I said, okay, this is interesting. Does she know who I am? I mean, did she look at a picture of me? Does she really know who I am? Um, but my agent said, yes, she does, Victoria. Then I read the first paragraph and of the proposal. And it was about J.P. Morgan, and he had this personal librarian, and I couldn't get past the first paragraph because I just wasn't interested in J.P. Morgan. I didn't write historical fiction. I just couldn't figure out what did Marie Benedict want with me. So my agent <laughs> kept calling saying, have you read the proposal? And I was like, no, I'm really busy. And so finally, <laughs> after three months, she said to oh. me, two pages? You cannot be that busy. <laughs> so I read finally the whole thing and it was about JP Morgan and his library and I just didn't care and he met this woman and blah. And the last paragraph said, and she was African-American passing um, as white. And I sat up in my chair. And yeah. then I went- <laughs> She played the lead. Yeah. <laughs> That was the lead, yes. I tell Marie all the time, that should have been the lead. <laughs> it took me three months. And finally, my agent wow. said, what are you doing? It's two pages. You don't. Ha you have time to read two pages. <laughs> and then after that, I was just, I, I was in. I was yeah. so How could you not be? honored. I was, yeah, I was so honored. And then our agents put us together. <clears throat> and I said hello, and Marie said hello, and we were instant friends. And by yeah. the time we met a few months later, we were sisters. It, it has oh. been an amazing experience for me. Well, she has that effect on people, doesn't she? She does. She does. <laughs> and we have so much in common. So. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, can you tell us a little bit about Belle and who she was and why you two really wanted to write this story about her? Well, you, Marie had actually found out about Belle years ago when she was still um, an attorney. And she used to go to the Morgan Library to just get away from the attorney life during lunch. Um, and she would go and imagine herself writing about people. And, and someone there at the library told her about Belle de Costa Green and how she was African-American and people didn't really discover that until she passed away because she burned all of her letters. She did not want uh, people to know because yeah. she didn't want it to affect the legacy of the library. That's what we believe. And so this, so Marie had it in her head for years to write about Belle. Hmm. And Marie will always tell you that she kind of felt Belle sitting in the corner, tapping her foot with her arms closed, saying, when are you going to get to me? But, but Marie never felt that she could write that book alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, she felt that she wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be authentic if she wrote it by herself. And uh, Marie and I did something the other night where I said, I couldn't have written this book alone. Um, it really did take two authors, one black, one white, to bring the truth of who Belle was to life. And she just has such a rich legacy because she's the daughter of Richard T. Greener. And in the black community, this is a man that we know. He was the first African-American to graduate from Harvard. In uh, fact, he inboxed me today saying, Belle Costa Green, is that Richard T. Greener's yes, daughter? It is. So cool. <laughs> I know. I was so happy to say, yes, it is. And yeah. so she would have never been able to hide her identity in today's mm -hmm. time. On mm -hmm. Instagram, it would have been all right. over the place. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. She would have never, on Facebook, everybody, she would have never been able to do it. It was only during that time. Yeah. And so she comes from her mother's family were free blacks who lived in Washington, DC in an area that's still known today as the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were all educated engineers and teachers, but her father was the grandson of a slave, uh -huh. um, but still very bright, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, but he was an activist 
And he believed that this country was one day going to grow up to be what it said it was going to be. And he wanted equality for everyone. Mm. His wife was in the was in the fight with him until the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was overturned. Oh. And once the Civil Rights Act of 18, see, most of us didn't know about the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which yeah. would have prevented a hundred years of what came after it. If the Supreme mm. Court had never overturned it, we'd live in a different world. Yeah. Uh, but it was overturned and then Jim Crow and everything followed. But his wife at that point said, you know what? We've been fighting, but I give up. Oh, wow. And I'm going to yeah. take this gift that I've been given yeah. of my skin. And we're going to raise our children as white. Wow. Um, because, and he said no. And he, they, they split up. And Bell was 16 at the time, yeah. which I think was such an amazing age. She was old enough to know what was going on, but too young to really make the decision about which way should she go. And mm -hmm. so she went with her mother. That was a long answer, wasn't it? No, no that, that was a fascinating, that's, that's yeah. fascinating answer. That's, a lot I that's, didn't know. That was yeah. really fascinating. Well, and it, it plays right into my question about living a divided life. You mm -hmm. know, she has that secret that she has to protect at all costs. And her anxiety about this and also the opposite feeling of, of relief, her, the duplicity and the divided self. It must have been, I don't know, so, um, what is that word I'm looking for? Schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not yeah. Because she was able to move freely in a world she loved, but she, in the back of her mind, she must have always feared about being given away. And tell us mm -hmm. if you would a little bit about that, Victoria. You know, um, there is a poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I, I think it was written in the late 1800s or the early 1900s um, called We We Wear a Mask. I think that's the title, We Wear a Mask. And he, it talks about being um, black in this world and having to wear a mask wow. um, all the time. And so some of that I think is in our DNA um, because now she had to do it to an extreme. Yeah. Um, but I think some of that is wound up in our DNA that in this country, we, we, we have to wear a mask mm -hmm. and she knew how to do it. Her mother actually taught her, but our, in, in the black community, we're constantly taught about wearing a mask and how to move through this world safely and, um, if you want an education, how what you have to do, all the rules and regulations that come with um, being that. So she had all of, she had been given all of that. Her, her, There was a way that she was raised as a fleet, which was her mother's family. Um, and so they were raised to behave a certain way, act a certain way. Um, but every night when she went home and she put her head down on her pillow, she was black. And there are, just, there are a lot of people that live that way, even if they're not, they don't have to be exposed. Um, one of the things that Marie was surprised to find out when I was talking to her about passing, because there's no one my age um, who's black who doesn't know someone, who, who doesn't have a great grandmother, grandmother, great, everybody knows someone who's passed. Um, wow. even, even my grandmother, but for convenience. So not every day, just for when she needed to go to the bank and they wouldn't let her, you know, she didn't want to walk around to the back or not to give wow. up or stuff like that. So everybody knows somebody. Um, but one of the things that I told Marie that she was surprised to find out was that Belle was never afraid of being outed by a white person. Yeah. She was afraid of being outed by a black person. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, wow. We all knew people who passed and we understand the shades of, uh, of the black community. Mm -hmm. And so when I put a picture of Belle up on my Facebook page, all of my Facebook friends say, how did she pass? <laughs> They're like, how'd she get away with that? She looked like my grandmother. How'd she get away with that? <laughs> my sister. Uh, you know, but but um, 
for white people, she looked white. And mm. so, but black people, no black people. So um, she was never, she was never afraid. She knew what she had to do to pretend because in, in the book, um, one of the things that we discovered during our research was they added her name Da Costa. Only mm. she and her brother used Bell Da Costa Green. And Da Costa was supposed to explain her her dusty complexion, you know. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm Portuguese. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So um, it was, but she she didn't have to worry about. She had to dodge black people. Yeah. Wow, hmm. wow. I was curious about how the sentence you just said about when she put her head down the pillow at night, mm -hmm. she knew she was black. Now you said she destroyed a lot of her letters, is that right? Yes, yes. We um, recently, Marie and I attended a virtual uh, event at the Morgan Library where they found letters that she had written to her love interest, the love of her life, mm. um, a married man. Of course. Which I was just like, okay, just bring the drama. Right? <laughs> it was the very complicated. Right it was complicated. <laughs> it was a complicated relationship because yeah. um, like right before she began the affair, she had lunch with him and his wife. And his wife yeah. was like, have a good time, honey. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was very stressed out. I know. <laughs> I felt the same. I was like, what's happening here? <laughs> I was She already has out. enough going on. I, know. I was stressed out. <laughs> I don't know if I could have gone to that lunch. Yeah. Um, but you I, took us to that lunch. Excuse me? I said you took us to that lunch. Oh, well, yeah. I, wanted <laughs> to, I wanted to. and then, I, But I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get Belle to the lunch. I really wasn't sure. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't because a couple of times I wanted her to go right back upstairs because yeah, this is not what this we was, do. No. Uh, <laughs> this so. is not what we do. <laughs> <laughs> She had enough going on. For she had sure. enough going on. Oh my God. Focus okay. Now. But we um, attended an event at the Morgan Library. And so many of the letters that she had written to Bernard mm -hmm. were saved. Mm -hmm. And so we get to discover um, a lot. Like, I, like have, Marie and I both wish so much that we had some of those letters. As we mm, were know that family, oh, yeah, even more insight into her, yeah. and I don't think we did enough justice to how much they loved each other. Oh, mm. I, I felt it. I felt it. I felt it. I. It, it, it was, once it was we read those letters, once we heard about those letters, mm -hmm. we're like, oh my goodness, yeah. they yeah. really, real. She was the love of his life. He was the love of her life, yeah. and yeah. they were both living with secrets. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's right. I've forgotten about his secret. Yep, yep, you're right. It, yeah, makes yeah. For a it makes for a complicated life, but it makes for great fiction, doesn't it? It sure it makes, does. You know, what's so interesting, we didn't have to do much for her story. It was just full of uh, just interesting intrigue because what would have happened if J.P. Morgan knew? I mean, he could have destroyed their entire family. Mm -hmm. uh, and because he would have felt like she tricked him and he yep. could have been embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then other on the other side, I wonder if he did one day discover it. And by then he was just going to play along. Yeah, it was not. I wondered that. I wondered that, too, because by then he respected her. And by then yes. he knew yeah. that his library depended yeah. on her. And by then there's a possibility. I'm not going to say anything else. I don't want to give anything away of this yeah. extraordinary book. OK. <laughs> So y'all know that every week we pick an indie bookstore. <clears throat> and this week, Victoria, you chose, is it Russo or Russo? Russo. Russo's Russo. I have, I have mangled some bookstores in my head. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I'm asking. She I'm has. asking. It's Russo. Yes. yes. Russo Books in Bakersfield, California, which, by the way, is where some of my favorite music has come from, the Bakersfield sound. And it is a family-owned store. And I have to tell you the sweetest thing when we asked Rick, when when our guru Meg asked Rick if he wanted to participate, he wrote back and said, this is a genius idea, not only promoting five active writers and their work, but inviting other guest authors into their community and to top it off, featuring an independent bookstore. Thank you for the invite. 
So we already oh, love him. Yes, we already indeed. love him. And I hope everyone orders books from them tonight. Yes. 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 So yes. tell us why you chose them. You know, that was when you asked me to recommend a bookstore, it was hard. And indie yeah, bookstores, it is hard. Indie so bookstores are the reason why I have my career. Yeah. Mm. Uh, because true. they, true. yes. Mm -hmm. So they hand sell your books. They, they know you, they have been promoting you mm -hmm. forever and ever. And it was the hardest thing to do. And I decided to do Russo's um, because I don't, I've only met him, Mike, I think once or twice, but he has an employee who works there who has been so supportive of my career for 20 years. That's amazing. Mm, that's great. And so um, I wanted to, that was the reason. It, and he's an employee. He, that, you know, he doesn't even own the store, but Jason Frost is, um, and he's not just supportive of me, just authors. And he loves to read. And you know, anybody who loves to read has my heart already. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so uh, that's why I chose him. It was so hard, though, because I could give you a list of independent yeah. bookstores who have supported me my whole career. So, but thank you for doing this. This was great. Oh, mm -hmm. my God. What a beautiful reason to choose the store, too. I, I love that. Um, so for all of you listening out there, you can get 15% off this week with no code required on The Personal Librarian and new and recent titles from all of us. So Victoria, a little bit earlier in the show, we talked about how our creative lives and our real lives kind of feed each other. Is there anything that this book taught you that you've carried forward in your life? You know, this book and, and even other books, but especially with Belle, has taught me patience. Mm. Um, oh. Just kind of and patience with everything. Like mm. in the creative process, mm. sometimes the writing doesn't come. You know, the mm -hmm. scenes yeah, yeah. Come all the time, they don't. And so if you wait, um, if, if you just wait yeah. and sit and let it settle in you, um, you'll come yeah. up with something better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's, there's a scene in the book where she goes back for her, her grandmother's funeral. And that was a scene where Marie and I waited we had a totally different scene and we knew it wasn't the right one, but we kind of waited. And then we got that scene, which is one of my favorite in the book. And um, she just, all Belle did was teach me what writing has been teaching me. Because usually when I get near the end of the book, of any book, I have no idea what's gonna happen. <laughs> so in, the oh, really? <laughs> in the beginning of my career, I used to panic and say, I don't know what's gonna happen, when it's got yeah. written this. And then I just kind of started sitting back and like usually the last three or four chapters, I don't know. And I just awesome. wait, mm -hmm. I wait and let it come. And I, some of my best endings just kind of came to me at 2.30 in the morning. Wow. wow. Oh, man. I wish my brain works that way at 2.30 in the morning. I don't even, I'm like, well, that's I usually when I worry about the bills and things that are not working out right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like, I forgot to pick up the dry cleaning. Right. Yes. Yes. I will wake up and then have to get on my phone. I'm so grateful for the phone because it used to be that I had to write it out. Yep. And it'd be so sleepy that in the morning I couldn't read what I'd written. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so now I will do the audio or it, it, they come to me at strangest times. Like I'm waiting, and waiting and waiting and I'm out with friends and I'm like, hold up a second. Uh, let me go take care of it. It never comes when I'm sitting at my desk. That's a good point. That's true. I never um, thought of trying the audio. That's actually yeah, a really good that's idea. A great yeah. Victoria. Oh, I do the audio a lot. I mean, I'll be out walking, thinking mm -hmm. about my dry cleaning and then... <laughs> And then the character will say something. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. It, it's kind of that idea of having your mind on something else, which frees yeah. up that creative space mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but Victoria, is there something you hope we take away from the book, that, that the reader walks away from, um, in, enriched in some way by reading this book? What, what do you hope we take away from it? You know what? I Heather, uh, Marie, I'm sorry. I keep calling her yeah. Heather. Um, yeah. Marie, we do too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Marie and I had an amazing time writing this book. Not only because it's such a great book, mm -hmm. but because we had to do the editing last summer. 
Mm. Um, we had to do the editing during a pandemic. And so we had time to just kind of sit and at home and look at each other on Zoom for three hours a day. And then we had to edit this book during all of this social unrest. Yeah. And oh, so wow. a lot of that made its way into the book because for the first hour, oh. just every single day, Heather and I talked just about what was going on and um, how wow. we both felt about it. And it had nothing to do mm. with them. We just talked about racial relations. If people listened to us, everything would have been already solved because <laughs> the two of us have worked. You should have recorded it. You have recorded, recorded it. everything. We didn't know how special that time was until looking mm -hmm. back. And yeah. so what we have talked about and what we hope is that as people read, they'll read this book together, like book clubs will come together. You know, people say that the most segregated time in America is Sunday morning um, and in church, but I think there's another time. I think it's in book clubs. Yeah. And so oh, I yeah. wish that book oh, clubs would wow. come together and read this because they're going to discover different things and and different takeaways and i think it will just lead to wonderful discussions that yeah. will just help yeah. just help us move forward that's what my greatest hope is that's with awesome. this book that's I a love great that. hope yeah and that that's sort beautiful. of leads into my question too because you worked with um, marie on this book and it was not your first collaboration was it and yeah. I just finished my first collaboration and I know that it really do, a lot depends on trust, not only the yes. talent, but of the individual. And can you talk about the process of collaboration a little bit, both with Marie for this book, but you said you also did other collaborations. Yes, I've done another collab, but I have another author, I, um, Rashonda Tate Billingsley. And I always say that I hit the Guinness Book of World Records because I have yeah. two authors I have collaborated with who are my sisters. Oh, Aww. that's nice. Uh, uh, and I think what you ha you have to kind of find your soulmate. And I've just been mm. blessed twice. I don't That's think you're going to get a third time. I've <laughs> 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 God for too much. Uh, you really do have to trust that each one of you have each other's best interest at heart. We're just yeah, trying to make it look good. But yeah. the blessing in this for me is that Rashonda and Marie are almost like the same person. They, there's one part of writing that they love that I can't stand. And then the part of writing that they can't stand, I love. So oh. both of them absolutely love the first draft. Oh, okay. So me getting words from my head onto the page is like pulling teeth without <laughs> any medication. Over <laughs> and over and over again. Um, and it's just so hard for me to get words down on the page the first time, unless I really, really see the scene. Okay. But then both Rashonda and Marie cannot stand the rewriting process. Oh, I can't uh -huh. Me neither. The rewriting neither. process is magic. <laughs> yeah, I actually agree. I love that. Is too. made. That's where yeah. every word counts and you go back and you make it better. And and neither Marie nor Rashonda have that kind of patience. And I'm loaded <laughs> with that kind of patience. That's awesome. So even though with both of them, we do write the first draft together, um, they have that's their greatest strength. Um, mm -hmm. whereas I'm like still looking for the medication because I can yeah. I need <laughs> I need wine or something to get this. You know, <laughs> I got to say, Victoria, that really is the secret. It took, it took Angela and I four years to figure this out because we were not under deadline at the beginning. And it really was figuring out what your strengths are, like you said, and, and what wasn't. Um, but you mentioned earlier, too, that this is genre historical is, is one that you've discovered that you really like. So will you collaborate again or are you going out on your own in this Genre. We are collaborating again. We just oh, signed great. up. Okay. Yes. There you are. So excited. 
we're going to write um, a book about Eleanor and Mary, Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary McLeod Bethune and their friendship. Oh, that's oh, awesome. lovely. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'm so, oh, I'm so excited about that's that. Awesome. And so we'll be doing that. But I already talked to Marie about a couple of ideas I had to when I have to do another solo mm -hmm. uh, project. And so um, I just love, I love this genre. I am not a genre writer. I just write what's in my heart in the moment. And sometimes yeah. it'll be suspense. Sometimes it'll be romance. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even call it anything. I don't yeah. call yeah. it anything. I call yeah. it my book, my next yeah. book. Yeah. Uh, but this, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. Uh, <laughs> know that feeling. That's awesome. yes. I got it. Researching, <laughs> and that was one of the things I love, the researching part of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is exactly what I want to talk about. Because <laughs> the, the research is what, gets you hooked on historical fiction. Mm -hmm. So you you start to learn okay. and, and see all these things rising from the past that we think don't matter anymore because they're past. And you're like, whoa, that's for me for today. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So sometimes when we write about real people, the the because I've done it too, we feel this compulsion. Right. Mm -hmm. And you, you said Marie felt like Belle was over there tapping her foot. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you better get I'm up. waiting. I'm waiting. <laughs> and I remember once asking her, um, you know, how she knew or if she was going to keep doing this and how she knew what was next. And she said she felt there were like all these women just waiting to be written about. Yeah. And that when she finally picked someone, it was like, it had to be done. But she yes. also told me that you were integral in the internal life of Belle in this mm. book. Ah. And so I know that you had to dive deep for the internal life that is so beautifully written in this book. So can you talk to me about how your research about her translated into bringing forth her interior life? Great question. That is a very good question. Um, <laughs> I want to write that question down and take it with me on every interview. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, you know, it wasn't as hard. What I loved about the research was finding out those little tidbits. Like, like Marie taught me about research and we both read the same biography, but then just going on the internet and finding an article that led to another article that led to another article. So for well, one sentence that ends yep. up in the book. Um, yep. like, I remember spending five hours and I discovered one sentence that a lot of people were questioning her complexion and wondered if she was from Cuba. Hmm. And so we put that in the book, but it took me five hours to find something yeah, interesting. But it didn't matter because I just love that. Yeah. But the internal part, I kind of, I knew it. Um, I obviously never passed, but I have been the only person in many environments. I've been the only black person in many environments. So I could imagine what it was like for her to walk into a room and to be the only person and all the pressure, the only person of color, and all the pressure of that and what it would feel like and what she felt like. I could imagine the things that her mother told her um, because my mother and my grandmother told us the same things. Mm -hmm. I can imagine what it was like to just go out into that world. So, so much of Belle's internal thinking and who she was came from a lot of how I was raised and how mm -hmm. This is how you have to be, shoulder straight. Belle's mother's voice was my mother's voice. Wow, okay. <laughs> you know, shoulder straight, sit up, turn your head, you know, um, just all of those those kinds of things. So that was actually part of the, that was kind of the easy part um, for me. That's why I think Marie wanted me to work with her on this project, uh, because she she felt that that would be something that I could bring 
Yeah. And yeah. Even, and even though this was Marie's idea, this was a one, she was so wonderful. Marie was so wonderful. This was a 100% effort on both of our parts. Yeah. Every single word we wrote together. I awesome. love that. I love that. Yeah. So I'm so week. sorry. I am talking and I muted myself. Um, <laughs> oh my every week, one of our favorite parts of the little just tech fail, just a small one, no problem. Um, one of our favorite parts of the show is receiving a writing tip from our guests. So Victoria, you've kind of already given us some amazing ones. Um, yes. And you have some incredible resources on your website, Website, a module for creative writing and self-editing, which I, I need. Um, <laughs> you teach writing. For any of you out there go, who are interested in that, go check out her informative website. Uh, but now we would love a writing tip if you have Thanks. another one for us, maybe. I do. One of the things that I try to tell all new writers is that you can't write a book in your head. You cannot. So you have to get that first draft down on paper. So I'm kind of preaching to myself when I'm saying yeah. this because yeah. I already said how hard it is for me. And you have to get it down on paper, no matter what. Absolutely. And I always tell people that when it's coming out of your head that way, you're giving birth. And if your first draft is not <laughs> ugly, you're doing it wrong. That's so true. <laughs> you're right. It's true. More, if your first draft looks good, there's something wrong. <laughs> Your first, your first draft is giving birth. And everybody knows that when a baby comes out of the mama, it's not very pretty. Everybody <laughs> knows the baby doesn't look good. Only the mama thinks the baby looks good. Even the dads know the baby's ugly. <laughs> and then what happens is that the baby gets cleaned up and you put on clothes and they grow up. And that's your second and your third and your fourth draft. But you can't write a book in your head. So just give birth to that ugly baby. <laughs> no one will see the baby. You get to clean up the baby, but you got to, you can't have a baby. You can't give birth to somebody who's ready to graduate from college. Mm. That is yeah. such good True. advice. I oh, love it. It's so oh colorful. God. It's really great. I love it. I like that. I, oh, Victoria. I am going to replay that. <laughs> That's definitely going to be like a show clip that we. I think so. Oh, that was awesome. that ugly, you're doing it wrong. That's I love cool. it. I love it. But All you right. love that ugly first draft, don't you? Yeah. you love that well, for me, I love the ugly first draft because then yeah. I get to do all the stuff I do well. Yeah, the craft. A draft only a mother could love. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. That's, That's our new hashtag. hashtag. I'm going to steal that. That's great. <laughs> a mother could love. Because even that. your dad is going to know what's ugly. But that's, <laughs> right. that's right. I'm, I think that's our new hashtag. Um, so, Victoria, we love to know what our guests are reading. We always find, as if our to be read stacks are not tall enough. But <laughs> could you tell us what you're loving right now? So uh, what I'm loving right now is I'm in the middle of the other black girl and I can't figure it out. So that's why I'm loving it. But Ooh. I finished a book that's probably one of the best books I've read in the last five years. Oh, wow. And it's called Yellow Wife. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We, we, we had her on. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, my yes. gosh. Yeah, we love that. That was a wonderful yeah. book. It truly that yeah. book, it is. It was brutal. Yeah. That was just brutal. Yeah. But it was the first book because obviously I've read about, I've read about that time period before, um, but I've always read about slaves, kind of like over there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This was the first book I can't tell you why I can't explain it where I thought about my own ancestors. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh. I have wow. no idea why, but I actually, as I was reading, started thinking, oh, I wonder what my great, great, great grandfather, you know, I mean, I honestly, this book made me think about my wow. aunts, and wow. I've never wow. do that ever before, ever. You have to meet Sadiqa. Yeah. Oh, I know she's a good friend of mine. Oh, she's awesome. Yeah, she's great. yeah she is um, wonderful. That was such a good book. It was yeah. a great interview. Too. I've, read her, I've read her other books. She's a great writer, but this is a, a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. On top of it, she's just a fascinating person. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's great. Yes, yeah. yeah, I just love great. the way she uh, came up with this book idea. Yeah, yeah yes. on that trail. Yes. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, 
All right. Anyone else have any books they want to talk about tonight? Yeah, I'll, I'll mention one. So Francesca Saratella's debut novel, Ghosts of Harvard, is brand new in paperback this week. It has a gorgeous new cover. It came out last year in hardcover. Um, and I would highly recommend it. It's, um, it's about a Harvard freshman who becomes obsessed with her schizophrenic brother's suicide. And then she mm -hmm. starts hearing voices. So it's really... Um, Wow. It's just this really kind of intricately plotted thriller, which maybe should not surprise anyone since um, she is the daughter of a very skilled writer known for her intricate plotting. She is the daughter of Lisa Scottolini, who is a great friend of our show. Um, so Francesca's amazing. Ghosts of Harvard is amazing. Out this week in paperback, I would recommend that. So I would like to suggest pre-ordering this book that's coming out in two weeks called The Forest of Vanishing <laughs> Stars. Oh, I've heard of that. I've heard of that. Oh, it it is. I don't know if y'all have heard much about it, but um, it is amazing and it is out it's in sad. two weeks and oh. they'll need to run and pre-order The Forest of Vanishing you know, Stars. I, I, I hear that author has some really good friends. Some really, <laughs> really <laughs> awesome yeah. author friends. Yeah. Has some yeah. Big advance <laughs> praise for that book. Yeah, that's, that's I've heard a lot about. of people talking about it. Just talking, <laughs> talking, talking. <laughs> but that's because we're on the thought. show every week and I think I make you listen to me talking about it, but thanks. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. super sweet. All right, everyone. Please stick around not only for our story point wine sip and stay after show it's just such a mouthful <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're gonna have to rename it <laughs> i you, you can't drink the story point and then say story point sip and stay after show or maybe you <laughs> need to drink we'll, more more of the story points. more that's probably that's the secret yeah but because we have one more question for Victoria, do not go anywhere. And we want to remind all of you out there to remember to check out our podcasts. We are so excited with what is going on with our podcasts. Mm -hmm. The Friends in Fiction Writer's Block podcast with superstar librarian Ron Block is every Friday now. Every Friday is a new episode wherever podcasts are found. And we played a video last week of Meg showing us how to use it. And we will cop it up again on the Facebook page for those of you who can't find it. This Friday coming up, you will hear an incredibly special episode called Origin Stories. And we talked to Chris Whitaker about his novel, We Begin at the End, and Amy Jo Burns about her novel, Shiner. You do not want to miss hearing the origin stories of these astounding novels. Oh, it's true. And gosh, Ron just does such a great job. Um, he's so, so that, great. Oh, he's amazing. We're so lucky. So another thing that you don't want to miss, and another reason we're so lucky, is we have the Friends and Fiction Official Book Club. It's headed up by our friends Brenda Gardner and Lisa Harrison, and they have such a great schedule coming up. So they just finished a fascinating conversation with our very own Mary Kay Andrews about the newcomer. And next up on July 19th is the Summer of Lost and Found with Mary Ellis Monroe. And then on August 6th, 16th, I will be joining them to discuss The Forest of Vanishing Stars, which you may have heard about. You may have heard a little bit more about here. <laughs> but it's, it's a great group, and we hope you'll join. It's so awesome. All right, and do you guys know that we have merch now? You guys asked for it, and we have it. So we've got t-shirts, wine cups, and coffee tumblers, and all sorts of exciting things. Um, we're partnering with Oxford Exchange. You can find them um, on our website, on Oxford Exchange website, and um, on our Facebook page. And don't forget, Mama Geraldine's is out there, our partner in entertaining and all things snacking. So snack on, y'all. And next no, week. I love when you say that. I know. <laughs> she's like, she's the one to say it. It's perfect. <laughs> next week, don't you don't want to miss us. We'll be back on our Facebook page at 7 p.m. for Kristen Higgins and Colleen Oakley. Both great stories. Uh, Unpack the Moon and the Vanishing Husband of Frick Island. And then the following week, another Friends in Fiction launch for a little thing we like to call the Forest of Vanishing Stars. <laughs> <laughs> and as usual, we have so many surprises in store for you. You guys, I'm crazy. So, okay, we you know are that you're completely <laughs> insane. I'm insane. You're crazy. Okay. Not. You guys, there's going to be a musical. We're doing a Forest of Vanishing Stars <laughs> musical launch. A musical. She I'm read the the musical. First. <laughs> um, there will be singing. Um, it won't all be good. There will be By dancing. Us. 
<laughs> yeah, um, there will be singing, and I'm not sure if that's a promise or a threat, but either way, we hope you will be here for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for our full schedule, please visit our website or check the sidebar on our Facebook page. And don't forget that if you miss an episode, you can find it on our YouTube Friends and Fiction channel. All right, Victoria, it's back to you. So <laughs> it's so interesting for us to not only know about your books, but also you. And one of the things we love to know about our authors is what shaped you into being a writer. And so can you tell us a little bit about the values around reading and writing in your childhood? Oh, my goodness. That's where it started for me. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my parents and my dad used to always say he knew I was going to do something because mm -hmm. with hiding, because when they would read to me, I would like stop them and ask them about the words and how did they get oh. on the page? And he would be like, can you just listen to the story? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> and, awesome. And my, I got my first library card when I was seven years old. And yeah. that was the greatest gift ever. Uh, my parents would take us to the yeah. library once a week, every Tuesday. I still remember that. And I was determined to read every single book in the children's section. Oh, wow. But what changed my life was also when I was seven years old, after being, just wanting to read all the time, I decided to write. And I wrote a play. And oh so I always tell people I wrote my first masterpiece when I was seven. And people say, how can you write a masterpiece when you're seven? And you can if you plagiarize. <laughs> and so where I plagiarized all the masterpieces. It was called Betty and the Witch. And she was a little girl who wore a school uniform with a red hood. And she had three bears for brothers, three pigs for sisters, and next door... There were seven little people. I wasn't going to steal everything. Ah, and the yellow brick road. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yellow brick road, but I had a good witch and a bad witch. Of course you did. <laughs> and, this, and I was in the second grade, gave it to my teacher. It was 20 pages. It had music, everything in there. And the entire That's second funny. grade performed it as a play. Oh, oh that's my amazing. Wow. Oh, that caught me by surprise. Pieces, pieces of it. I remember her saying, since I wrote it, that I could choose the part I wanted to play. Oh. And then I remember in the assembly when after it was over, she introduced me to the parents and everybody else that was in there as the writer. Oh. And that was oh. when I became a writer. Oh, I have to say, that's, that's pretty great. impressive. A that's a whole answer. lot more than I got. Do you want to be a writer when you grow up? You were a writer I with a produced writer. play. And it was <laughs> so good because all the other masterpieces were good. So I put them <laughs> together. Nobody had put them together before. Oh, and my gosh. So I put them together. So I've that's stopped amazing. playing. Gloria, that's amazing. And yeah, she amazing. had the library. Patty, she had the library. The library. Everybody, see, told you. I what think I bet it's Mary Allison, too. that it's 99.9. I, I think so. I oh, what did you say, Mary? Everybody, everybody mentions the library. What, a, what yeah. a great affirmation that teacher yeah. gave you. Yes. You know what? Yes. A couple For life. Of years ago, I yeah. said to my mother, I just so wish I could find Mrs. Asness. You know, I, I don't yeah. think she's yeah. around yeah. anymore. But I just so wish that she knew yeah. what she'd done for that little girl. Yeah, yep. so yep. incredible. But what she did, it took me a, a while to get there, but from that day, I knew I was going to be a writer. I knew I it. That. I knew That's it. Amazing. I knew That's amazing. I was going to get there. I didn't know. I didn't know the path. Yeah, but I knew it. That's awesome. Yeah. Incredible, Victoria. You are astounding, yeah. and we are so happy that you came to talk yes. to us and mm -hmm. talk about the personal librarian. And to all of you out there, we encourage you to grab the personal oh, librarian. I'm so yep. excited about it. It's an astounding book, preferably from our bookseller of the week, Russo Books, which I just said correctly. And the <laughs> link is on our Facebook page under announcements. Victoria, and Marie, we you. hope you get home safely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. We missed yes. you tonight. We missed you. But you were here in spirit with yes, she you were was. here with Victoria. Yes. So, Victoria, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for coming. Thank you. This was so much fun. Who could have imagined? <laughs> this was so much fun. This Very was funny. great fun. You were a great so, guest. Thank you. You were 
Yeah, mm -hmm. you're so interesting. So next yeah. up is our story point sip and stay where you never know what will happen next. <laughs> so we'll see you in a minute and come back next week, same time, same place as we welcome Kristen Higgins and Colleen Oakley. And then the following week, the guest, <laughs> Forest of Vanishing Stars. <laughs> So good night, y'all. Thank you. Good, good night, night, Victoria. Victoria. Good night, Victoria. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night. Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. She it was, was and she did a great job with Marie gone. She carried beautifully. Oh Patty, good. Gosh. You did a wonderful hosting job. Yeah, you oh, did, Patty. I mean, the musical. I forgot to put where Marie lived, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's you knew. <laughs> okay, before we get started in our Story Point Sip and Stay after show with our Story Point line. Oh, um, where's my glass? All of you out there have followed them on Instagram and Facebook, right? Well, now we're going to prove the power of friends and fiction readers. And I want you to all go visit storypointwines.com and click on Story Point Insider and sign up for their email newsletter list. They'll send you all kind of information on wines, news, <laughs> events, and who knows, maybe someday there'll be a, I don't know, friends and fiction event. So visit Story Point Wines and click Story Point Insider. And I so, have to, I have to say, Patty. Speaking of Story Point, I it's been hot. We've all had a lot of hot so weather. Hot. That Story Point Chardonnay. Oh, oh it's mm, so good. I had it. Yummy. Oh, I know. It's yeah. so good. We had I'm it not Father's drinking because I have a cold. But it's otherwise, good. I'd be guzzling right now. It's so good. Oh. It really is. Yep. One of my your, favorites. Your cold is still hanging on. That's too bad. Yeah, it's, it's a lingering, uh, never sorry. clutch, never letting go. Wow. Oh, that's too bad. Probably it's better you though, right? Pops. You've probably been. I'm, I'm just going to save it. I'm moving. I'm saving it for all of you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. I'm not going to hug you. I'm going to blow you a kiss from far away. <laughs> Love from over here. Oh, yeah, no. yeah. I'm oh. trying my best. I'm drinking that emergency, not story point wine. I'm drinking emergency. <laughs> you know, those things. Way you less fun. Yes. Yeah, way <laughs> less fun. Way less Mr. fun. Mr. MKA woke up. Um, Saturday, Sunday morning, not feeling great. And so I started, you know, basically supercharging him with emergency. Yeah. 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 And they I are not a sponsor. But <laughs> oh, not yet. yet. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. Hilarious. You know, usually every morning, um, I don't know if people out there know, I, lots of us, several of us start out writing like at seven in the morning. And he's been very sweet. I don't drink coffee. I'm a weirdo. I have a Diet Coke in the morning. So usually he goes down and gets my Diet Coke for me. <laughs> this morning, I went down and got him a cup of tea and was smoking. Oh, he really is sick then. Yeah. He's not really sick. He just doesn't feel yeah. awesome. Oh, that's yeah. too bad. This is a corker. This, a okay. lot of people are getting so it, by crazy. the way. This weather is so crazy. It's the our, weather, and we've also all been cooped up in our houses for a year yeah. and a half, and now yeah. we're out in the world. Yeah, so. it, it, we have like no immunity to anything. No, yeah, no we forgot day, how to be human beings. Of, today was the first day of summer. What did you guys yeah. do for the first day of summer? Oh, oh sat in my house pretty much. <laughs> um, today, today was not a good worked. day. Yeah. <laughs> I went to like 11 different grocery stores and prepared food places and had my oh. car washed and um, tried to find Topo Chico, which I did. I did, you guys. Topo Chico. <laughs> so the reason <laughs> bubble, for those bubble. of you out there who are confused about Christie's sudden need for food <laughs> is that <laughs> She is stocking our <laughs> houses for the live event in Beaufort this mm -hmm. week. Because I love them. 
And we love you back. And I want them to eat lots of good food while they're here. <laughs> I, I suspect she's trying to make up for the lack of monogram sheets. Is is there yeah. is there a yeah. surprise yeah. that there aren't going to actually be monogram yeah. sheets for us? She was not. Wait, what? She was not, <laughs> she was not writing this morning. And so we, Patty and I decided that she was out getting the, uh, was it portaled or fret mm -hmm. sheets? It was portaled, oh. portaled monogram mm -hmm. sheets for us. Yes. Our sheets oh, monogram. Okay. okay, fair, fair. As, as long nothing as you're on is, it, Christy. Nothing is too good it. for you guys. I hope you have room in your suitcases to take them back with you. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're so excited, excited to come we're to your hometown. <laughs> we're so Christy, excited. Christy, we're way fancier than that. We just dispose of our monogram sheets. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next. I'll keep one. them. <laughs> Okay, so I do have to say, I want to go back to Victoria for a second because yeah. I have to say that her talking about the interior life yeah. of Belle de Cos and knowing question. what that felt like and what it might mean to, and I, I hadn't heard that phrase until I read the book, but passing, like it's yeah. a it's a phrase. Oh, you have? Mm -mm. Pass, oh, there's, yeah. a famous, there's a famous old movie, I think it, Eartha Kitt, stars in it and she's passing no, something like oh, oh, i know i know which one you're oh, thinking about half. yeah 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 i mean the vanishing yeah. half yeah the vanishing is, half yeah. Yeah. yeah no but um honestly i, I didn't was know a white, jennifer she, oh my gosh i know the movie you're talking about she was i'm looking it up on imd i am yeah but you know what the other thing i love that she talked about was how cool would it be if book clubs which I mean, we yeah. I, we have my book club is um, largely white, but one we have a one black woman in our group. Then we've all been friends for millions of years. We work together at the paper, and wouldn't it be cool if book clubs, black and white book clubs, could come together to and talk read this about, book together? Yeah, yeah, to read a book like this, or The Vanishing Half, or any of those books, or The Yellow Wife. That would be how cool would that be? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. and, and just you know, the when she was talking about the lost letters and how Belle burned the letters yeah, um, and how much it, it would have helped them to write the story if they had had those letters. Um, but yet when you read the book, it's like they did have the letters. Mm -hmm. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I the letters would have been great to have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt that the whole time I was writing about Lewis. I was like, why are you burning letters? Like, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. You know someone's going to write about you one day? Edith Vanderbilt and her sisters burned all of their letters when they did were. They? Mm -hmm. Did they? You know, so I understand Lewis, that. I, I kind of understand why people do it. But when you yeah. think about posterity, it's such a loss, you know. But mm -hmm. I, I do understand why people would have the inclination to want their privacy yeah oh uh, i still yeah. have all the all the letters that tom and i wrote to each other Aww. in college and they're searing intellectual studies about um <laughs> i don't have enough money to call you so <laughs> getting a ride home so i just love Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying I just love letters so much. Like I, yeah. I feel like I write them in like a lot of my books. I just love letters. I think they're amazing. Now, not that I write them to people in real life as much as I should, but I really do love them. I save all of them. Like I have, there was this one I got from a friends of fiction person today, and it was like so long and so well written. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is so beautiful. I'm gonna save this forever. You know, I found when I was passing out all this mem memorabilia for my kids when they came. Um, I found letter that my father had written to me when I was young. Oh, and he wow. even, when he passed, saved letters that I had written to him. Wow. And, you know, I, you forget how you are at that age, too, right. you yeah. know, to the letters. And it does, you're right. Maybe we should all write letters more often. I don't know, though. Sometimes I go back and read, like, my old journals, and I'm like, oh, God. This is so oh, nasty. the journals are awful. Oh, I <laughs> diary. I have a weird diary. I have a thing in my will. That my journals must be burned <clears throat> upon my. <laughs> I'd like to go back and look at them to see, you know, yeah. maybe what my goals had been or how far I'd come or yeah. not come or what I thought in seventh grade, but nobody else needs to know that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the only time I kept a journal for any length of time, I think I was a high school 
junior and my boyfriend who was a senior broke up with me. And so the entire year was this incredible, agonizing thing about why did he, why did he break up with me? And then it was all, and part of it was like how much I hated my brothers and why did he break up with me? And I was reading I was reading like the sappy. I, I think I wrote sappy poetry. Too. I was going to say there had to be poetry yeah, in some there. Poems, I was yeah. Bathing in my mm -hmm. agony and my mm -hmm. misery. Okay, mm -hmm. let's be honest, girls. Back in the day when we were like eight, 12, 13, they weren't journals. They were diaries. Dear yeah, diary. Yeah, they're diary. Yeah, oh, yeah. Dear diary. Yeah, my yeah, diary. Mine was, yeah. 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 yeah, mine was literally, I think, like a uh, black and white composition book. I didn't have a diary, but I oh, kept them. On top. We had bookshelves. I shared a room with yeah. my with my little sister, and I I hid it on top of those bookshelves. And when um, my parents moved, my mom, being my mother, just shoved everything into a box. It's here somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> find it. Um, I have the coolest thing and I like didn't even realize this, but I used to go to camp every summer. And so my friends and friend, like my guy friends, like people who you would not think would like write you letters at camp. Like I clearly like on pain of death was like, you will write me letters at camp. Or, I mean, I have these most amazing letters from all of my oh, friends and they used to keep nice. notebooks when I was gone and they would write, like if there was a party and I wasn't there, they would write me notes. And then and I had to have these notebooks of like Aww. everything that was going on while I was at camp. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. I should like use some of these. They're yeah. so that's awesome. awesome. Young adult book or a big, that would be really I was just thinking book. when, who said it? I think Christy said, Dear Diary. I'm like, that's a good book title, mm. Dear Diary. Yeah, yeah. All right, Diary ladies. Of a kid. <laughs> yeah. Diary What's of that? <laughs> that one's done okay. <laughs> that one's got a few readers. Yes, oh, thanks. You have to have a lot of art to do that one, I'll tell you. All oh, right. That would not be me. All we'll right, ladies. A what a night. What a night. That was yeah, we have to get up. We have to get up. Some of us have to get up and catch a plane in the morning. I a lot of you do. I have to drive to Southern Pines and then. Perform, what time is your southern? Drive. What time is your southern pines? Like yeah. eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock. So it's okay. um till all I know is I'm there till like three thirty ish. Okay. So then I get in the car and drive to Beaufort. Yay! We'll see y'all. We'll Take care, everyone. I'll see you in the see you Sky Club, Patty. Bye. 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 See you at the airport. Bye. <laughs> Bye.